Agnes Bain pushed her toes into the carpet and leaned out as far as she could into the night air. The damp wind kissed her flushed neck and pushed down inside her dress. It felt like a stranger's hand, a sign of living, a reminder of life. With a flick, she watched her cigarette doubt fall, the glowing embers dancing sixteen floors down onto the dark forecourt. She wanted to show the city this claret velvet dress. She wanted to feel a little envy from strangers, to dance with men who held her proud and close. Mostly, she wanted to take a good drink, to live a little. With a stretch of her calves, she leaned her hip bone on the window frame and let go of the ballast of her toes. Her body tipped down towards the amber city lights and her cheeks flushed with blood. She reached her arms out to the lights, and for a brief moment she was flying. But no one noticed the flying woman. Thank you. Douglas Stewart, thank you so much for reading from your magnificent debut novel, Shaggy Bane. I could not love a, bo a book more than I love this one. It's a real pleasure. I want to tell the viewers a little bit more about you. Douglas Stewart has won some of the world's most prestigious book awards, awards for this um, first novel, including the Booker Prize. Shaggy Bain is the heart-wrenching story of the love between Agnes Bain and her son Shaggy as she sinks into alcoholism and he grapples with his sexuality. It's the story of a childhood marred by poverty set in Scotland in the 1980s. It took 10 years to write and was rejected by more than 30 publishers. Well, it was published and now it's been translated into numerous languages, including French. Congratulations on all of that. Now, Douglas, this book follows the struggles of a young boy mm -hmm. trying to keep his mother away from alcohol. Mm. How much of this story is your story? Well, I always say it's a work of fiction, but I certainly grew up in the same conditions that Shuggy does. Uh, I use the, the veil of fiction in order to tell the story from many different perspectives. But for me, I grew up as poor as Shuggy. I was as lonely and as queer as Shuggy. And also my mother suffered with alcoholism all of my life from my first memories until I lost her when I was 16 years old. And so I understand the themes I write about from the inside, but I wanted to make it a work of fiction so that I could really invite readers into the story and make it feel as immersive as possible. It's also the story of what it was like to grow up gay in a hard man's world um, in 1980s Glasgow. Homophobia and ca was casual mm -hmm. and every day. Um, there's one scene in the book where Shuggy's older brother tries to teach him to walk like a man. Yeah. It was a time when people thought being gay could be fixed. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Yeah, it was, I was trying to write about the homophobia in the book in a very clear-eyed way. Uh, and Shuggy is just a young boy. He's only six or seven when the men around him, the boys around him, realize he's very different to them. And actually, he's effeminate and he's sensitive and he's a little fussy. But it's really this effeminacy that, uh, that's under attack. And, and they say that he's no right and what is wrong with you. Um, and what it really does is it plants the seeds of self-hate inside Shuggy. And he believes that he should try and change. One of the central questions of the book is, uh, why can't you be normal? Now, of course, what is normal? But, but people say that to his mother because his mother is a woman who's living on the edge and also Shuggy because he's, his masculinity doesn't fit in to this very narrow time. And so he spends a lot of time in the book trampling fields of grass flat, trying to learn how to walk like a proper man. He reads historical uh, football scores, almost like the, the rosary. He tries to take them in as though that would change him somehow. And of course, none of us can change who we are and he's perfectly fine as he is, but he's just trying to find a, a place he belongs. And from the fiction of Agnes Owens to Kelman to Irvin Welsh, there are many male addicts mm -hmm. and sort of lovable rogues mm -hmm. in Scottish literature. Um, but this is about the effects poverty had on women and children. Mm -hmm. And fallen women are judged much more harshly mm. um, than men, aren't they? Um, why is that, do you think? I think, you know, one of the things I try to show in the book is many things fail. The community fails, the Thatcher government fails, the men fail. But when everything's fine until the mother fails at the heart of it, and then we're really, truly in trouble. You know, men, when they suffer with addiction, because it was such a patriarchy where uh, the world was defined by what your father did or did not do for work. Uh, socially, it was all about football and drinking in the pubs. But I remember a time when my mother couldn't go into a pub. She had to be invited in by a man, and then they would sit in a snug. And so when women drink or when they fall to addiction, it tends to be a very private affair and it's kept at home. And there's just so much stigma and isolation around that. And the community, when a, when a woman does that, blame, don't seem to see the hurt that the character or the person might be feeling, but seem to say they're feeling, seem to see 
their failings as a mother and how they seem to be letting down the community around them. And it's an incredibly harsh judgment. I know from my own experience with my own mother how quickly people turned away from a woman when she is incredibly hurt like that. And as you say, Shaggy stands in a long literary tradition of the suffering soul or, or this industrial landscape. But, but these works of literature, these works of cinema, often focus on the heterosexual man. But I'd always known women to be the heart of these communities and the strength of these communities. And so Shaggy almost pushes the men to the landscape and, and really just focuses on those stories. And your mum died when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, at 16, you lived in a hostel mm -hmm. in Glasgow. You supported yourself right. um, by going to school, but working in the evenings. Um, you went on to study textile design and became a fashion designer for Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren, Banana Republic. That is an incredible journey for someone who had such a difficult upbringing. What drove you? Well, I think, first of all, there was no resting for me. There was no reverse gear. Uh, from 16, I'm living by myself. I, I never knew my father, so he had died when somewhere in my youth, and so I'm orphaned. And so there was no possibility of me resting or figuring out my world or, or thinking about what I wanted to do. And I think people think I had enormous dreams that I could see something on the horizon. And the truth is, is I didn't. I just kept working. And in fact, when I went into textiles, I didn't know what textiles were. This, this is maybe not something that a 17-year-old boy knows about. But I was grateful to have an opportunity to learn a trade and learn a skill and I just kept building and building um, and actually in many ways that was how I approached the writing of Shuggy Bain too when I first sat down to write the book I didn't I couldn't imagine that I was trying to write a book it was far too intimidating of a thought here was a young man who had grown up incredibly poor in a very classist society and so English and academia and literature didn't seem like something that was available to me and so in 2008, when I begin to write the book, I just sit down to write simply and purely. I write a sentence, I write a paragraph, and then it, it starts to really flow from there. And being in New York as a fashion designer, did that give you the distance you needed emotionally, perhaps? It did. Uh, I think distance always brings an awful lot of clarity for you, which was really helpful in writing the story. But it also made me incredibly homesick. Uh, not only uh, for the place, but also for the time. You know, Glasgow is an incredibly proud city. It's full of compassion and humanity. But in the 1980s, it went through a really tough time under the Thatcher government. And I, I understood as an immigrant in New York that not many people understood that time, that they didn't know what it was like and where I was from. They assumed I was very much like them. And so I felt erased by that, that they, they couldn't see the entirety of me as a person. You know, they saw this fashion designer that had a very uh, privileged life in a way, but they didn't understand the poverty that I'd come from. And so in a lot of ways, Shuggy's a little bit of an introduction for myself to the world. It's a bit of a manifesto. It's a big manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you married your husband the day you got your book deal. I did. For Shuggy Bain. Today you're like this multi-award winning author, a proud gay man living in New York. Um, what do you think your mum would say about the book and about your success? Uh, I think mothers are always proud of their sons, so I think my mother would be absolutely thrilled. I couldn't imagine any of this for myself when I was a young man, but I think, and neither could my mother, but I think she would be very proud. You know, one of the main reasons for writing the book is I was trying to answer some silence. Uh, as the son of a mother who suffered with addiction, you learn a lot of coping strategies or ways to try and keep your mother from sinking into too much depth, I suppose. And one of the things I learned when I was seven or eight was if I sat and listened to my mother's stories, if I gave her someone to talk to, then she wouldn't drink as much as she might otherwise. And so at about seven or eight years old, I began to write her memoirs. We called them her memoirs. And they were never these once upon a time stories. They were always quite honest, uh, candid tales of her youth. But she just loved having someone to talk to because she felt like uh, no one could hear her, I think, in the outside world. But the, the memoirs always started the same way, and it was always to Elizabeth Taylor, who knows nothing about love. And I thought that was incredibly bold for this working class woman from Glasgow <laughs> to start her life story by telling Elizabeth Taylor what she did not know. And you're writing your third book. I am. Um, it's set in the north of Scotland. You keep returning to these themes of love and loss, mm -hmm. belonging and loneliness. I wondered, will you ever return to Shaggy Bain and complete the story that we left this young chap as a teenager in a hostel? Yeah. You know, I think what I'm trying to do in a way is to tell Shuggy's story by not directly telling it. And so even my second novel, Young Mungo, 
which publishes in English uh, next April and in French in January 2023, uh, is a life that runs parallel to Shuggy and so explains the world even deeper. As you say, I'm always writing about belonging, but I'm also writing about tender souls in hard places. I'm fascinated by men who are incredibly gentle when the world wants them to be otherwise. And, and so this is a love story that I'm writing next about two young boys who fall in love across a sectarian divide. And so in a way, although that's not Shuggy's story, you can almost imagine it's part of the tapestry of his life. We're running out of time, but just before we go, I want to talk a bit about Glasgow. Mm. Incredible city. The Climate Change Conference COP26 is mm. going to be there um, in the city in November. The city in the book is a character mm -hmm. in itself. What does Glasgow represent for you? Glasgow for me is all about the people. Uh, it's a place where there's so much uh, solidarity and compassion. And I always think about even in a, in a sad time or in a difficult time, how the people respond with humor and with kindness. But Glasgow's home for me, even as an immigrant who's lived in America for 21 years, I think that's really where my heart is and, and that's where I belong. Okay, well, we're going to play out with some fantastic photos of Glasgow taken in 1978 that were discovered in a loft. They're taken by Joss Treen and they're on display at Mary Hill Burr Halls in the city and captured the hardships, resilience and humour of the people living in Glasgow at the time. Douglas Stewart, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you. Shuggy Bain is out in French now. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. France 24 en español. Pasa 24 horas. De difusión diaria. 24 horas para informarse de, de toda la actualidad. De América Latina y... y el mundo. Todos los días desde el terreno. A, a través de nuestros noticieros. Y programas hablamos. Con los dirigentes del continente. Y también de los que hacen la actualidad política. Económica. Artística y cultural. Para ofrecerles una información completa del mundo. Que confronta todos los puntos de vista. Nuestras redacciones en América Latina y en Francia trabajan en estrecha colaboración para estar siempre presente en todos los eventos importantes y proponerles una mirada diferente. France 24 en español, ahora, todo, todo el, el día. día. Liberté, égalité, actualité.